firsts. Um, and so Alicia, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, hopefully we will do this again sometime when you can come and be with us in person and not just virtually, um, but it's really a pleasure to have you. Thanks and take it away. Um, thank you, Daryl. Uh, thank you, everyone, to, for assisting to my talk today. So let's share this um, talk. So yeah. So well, uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you for inviting me today to give this uh, seminar talk. Uh, for those of you that didn't know me, I'm Alicia or you can also call me Ali. And as Daryl said, uh, today I will bring some of my X-ray and uh, science uh, about life and death of neutron star in binaries. So um, first of all, I would like to introduce you why X-ray binaries, no? And so in general, X-ray science is a, power a powerful tool that he help us to disentangle what we can not see with our naked eye and for uh, during our daily life has a different applications. As you can see here, the poor Mr. Frog has discovered something weird inside him. But however, uh, for us, uh, oops, sorry, in astronomy or in astrophysics, we use X-rays to study the most powerful phenomena in the universe. And this uh, data uh, we cannot access from our ground-based facilities. And we need to use special facilities in uh, in the space. So let's start a little bit with our uh, tale. So once up, up, upon a time, we have uh, high, mass star, high mass stars in a binary. And through uh, the stellar evolution, the most massive star of the primary uh, transfer material to the companion. And after some time of evolution, this primary undergoes through a supernova explosion forming the neutron star from in a neutron star or collapsing in a black hole. So of course, the evolution continues and the secondary continues evolving. And at some point we get our high mass, uh, high mass X-ray binary that we will now use a snapshot in X-rays for this uh, state of uh, this phase in the story. However, if we continue in uh, our tail, we see that also the secondary evolves, and after a certain time and uh, certain states, it always it also uh, undergoes through a supernova explosion, forming either a neutron star or black hole. And finally, we have our binary with a double uh, or binary with two neutron stars, two black holes, or neutron star black hole. And after time, uh, uh, it will evolve, and uh, at the end, we will get our merge merger of. Uh, sorry, compact uh, object binary merger that uh, we can study with, thank you to the multi-messenger uh, astronomy uh, through gravitational waves and then undergoing also observing GRBs and multi-wavelength uh, emission. So let's uh, get our focus in high mass extra binaries and later on at the end of the stage of this uh, binary. Um, so, Specifically, I will talk today about a certain kind of high mass binary and it's called a BX ray transient. So, okay, what is a BX ray transient? A BX ray transient is a binary that harbors a highly, highly magnetized neutron star. That means that the magnetic field strength is 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13 Gauss. And this neutron star orbits around, around its companion. And this companion is what we call BE type star. So the BE comes from the existence or of this, the, what we call the creation disk. The E comes because uh, we see uh, if we go into the optical and get an spectrum, an spectrum, we see emission lines and these emission lines comes from this degradation disk. Now, how this degradation disk is formed is because these uh, stars are highly active and expel a lot of material and they are uh, rotate fastly. So the material around uh, the star uh, becomes a store in the equatorial plane of the star. So now please don't, uh, let's not uh, uh, get confused about the accretion disk, which is, which is the disk around the companion star and accretion disk, which is the disk around the neutron star. So um, when this neutron star goes through the accretion disk, 
uh, we see two type of transient phenomena. So the first one that we, we find is what we, we call type one uh, outburst. And we see that these type one outbursts are related to the periastron passage of the neutron star. So what we call periastron, as you can see here, is the closest point to the companion star in the orbit. So here you see our light curve. And as you can see, these outbursts are uh, in agreement with the, pass, with the pass of the periastron, which are the vertical lines. The peak luminosity of these events are normally 10 to the 36 to, the, to, the, to 10 to the 37 x per second. However, we also find another kind of uh, transient phenomena, what we call type two outbursts. And these outbursts uh, can last more than or uh, one orbital period. As you can see here in this X-ray like of the system, these type two outbursts last like three orbital periods. And they are much more luminous than the type one outburst. And even they can exceed the uh, luminosity, uh, the limit, uh, Eddington limit uh, for a neutron star. The existence of a type one outburst doesn't uh, mean that we don't have type one, because for example, like in this case for this system, we can see also that it show nicely type two out, type one outbursts uh, after the big one. So a lot of studies have been done during this time for this, uh, let's say, high luminosity uh, phase of these systems, since we have a lot of the data, photons, and then we can nicely study these systems during these stages. However, our question was like, okay, what, what is happening with these systems when they are not in outbursts? What we can see uh, during this state when, you know, in the past we didn't have enough uh, quality data, and especially what is happening to the neutron star where it's close to a pastron, defining a pastron as the farthest point of the orbit to the companion. So, okay, uh, there were, the, we have a lot of uh, opening, open questions like are the X-ray transients still detectable when not in outburst? What kind of physical scenarios can we find uh, at low X-ray luminosity? Do all the X-ray transients show the same behavior? And um, if, uh, is this transient phenomena uh, similar to the low magnetic field neutron stars binaries? That means those what we call also low mass X-ray binaries. So thanks to facilities as SWIFT, XMEM, and Chandra, uh, we came with some uh, answers to these questions. And what we found is that the neutron star spin period and magnetic field strength are key components for uh, uh, the answers of these questions. So let's first go and uh, introduce what we found at this uh, physics out, what we call physics, physics of the out of the outburst regime. First of all, we can find what we call propeller regime and maybe low level accretion. So what is the low, what is a propeller regime? So during outburst, the accretion rate is so high that matter over overcomes the centrif centrifugal barrier created by the combination of the neutron star spin period and the magnetic field lines. And in this way, the matter is accreted on the magnetic poles of the neutron star. However, sorry. However, uh, when um, the accretion rate uh, starts to decrease, uh, the effect of this centrifugal barrier uh, defects are more important and more noticeable. And at some point, the matter starts to be pro propeller, propel away. And therefore, mat the matter or the accretion, the accretion of matter on the neutron star surface is inhibited. So the problem here is that is uh, when this thing happens, if uh, there is a still a, a, a possibility that a low level accretion or what we call leakage of matter can still overcome the centrifugal barrier and being accreted on the neutron star uh, pole. So what, how can we observationally uh, detect this? Well, in our light cures, what we expect is like a rise due to the uh, outburst. And once uh, it starts decreasing, if it enters the propeller regime, we expect to see like a, a, a Steep, uh, the steep to change and decrease fastly. And this decrease uh, is the, of the order of some days. While a normal decrease in the outburst would take maybe 20 days, this uh, change uh, is seen as a change in days. 
Another scenario could be the heating, what we call heating and cooling scenario from the neutron star uh, uh, crust. Um, this has been uh, deeply, or let's say, uh, studied by, for low mass uh, extra binaries, uh, where we say there is like low magnetic field neutron stars where the, or the, with magnetic field strength of 10 to the 9 Gauss. So several orders of magnitude uh, lower than what we are seeing in the X-ray transients. So for a, a little bit of uh, background, introducing this uh, called uh, heating cooling scenario, what I would like to say is that uh, before the outburst, uh, the crust and the core of the neutron star are in thermal equilibrium. And during outburst, uh, a, a matter is accreted on the surface of the neutron star. And this uh, matter starts to uh, compact <clears throat> the inner layers of the crust. And this uh, ignites or uh, lead to uh, exothermical reactions in the crust that release heat. So therefore, the thermal equilibrium is broken. Once the uh, outburst is finished, then this heat that has been stored in the crust is, uh, tends to be emitted towards the core and also outside of the surface. So how we can detect this uh, cooling emission is that, uh, as you can see here, after the peak of the outburst and once the accretion has uh, uh, stopped, we see a decrease in the temperature of the, I mean, uh, the temperature of the neutron star surface. And as we can see in the light curve, we expect to see uh, a decrease in the luminosity. So that was for, OK, uh, low magnetic field neutron stars. However, what happens with high magnetic field neutron stars? We expect that because we have these high magnetic fields, that we, we expect to find these magnetic fields inside of the crust of the neutron star. Now, the question is, First of all, what is the, the strength of these magnetic fields there? And second of all, what, are, what is the structure of these magnetic fields? So, and how this affects the heating and cooling of the neutron star. So it can be that uh, maybe these uh, magnetic field lines inside of the crust due to the, the structure uh, concentrates the heating or the, uh, the reactions and the heating close to the core le le leading to a colder surface of the neutron star. So therefore, we see just a cold uh, surface. Or maybe the magnetic field lines uh, just st uh, may, like, uh, store the reactions and the heat in the most uh, out, la out layers. And maybe we see that the neutron star is warmer or hotter. However, in the inner part of the neutron star, we have a cold uh, crust and core. Or, however, we have a strange configuration of magnetic field lines, and then everything is a mess, and we don't know what is happening there. So, for getting some of the answers, we started uh, started looking at these systems at low X-ray luminosity, and we try to up, uh, we are still at trying to upgrade our uh, code what called in a school that we were applying for uh, low magnetic field neutron stars to include the magnetic field and the structure. Um, Continuing with the different uh, physics, uh, uh, phys physical scenarios, we also can find some co something called cold disk accretion. So for certain neutron stars, after the outburst, the accretion disk uh, becomes cold and then the matter is not ionized. So this led to the uh, accretion disk uh, become closer and closer to the neutron star. And once it gets closer to the neutron star, due to the rotation and the proximity to the light like radiation from the neutron star, this matter in the disk starts to be ionized. And once it's completely ionized, it's uh, conducted towards the, the neutron star poles. And then is when we see the accretion from this cold disk. So what we expect here is that, as you can see here, the during outburst, the accretion disk is filled. Then we have a decay, and then we see a constant emission above the propeller regime of the system. And at some point, the, peri uh, the neutron star reaches again periastron, the accretion disk is filled again, and then we will see this behavior continuously in these systems. 
So I will summarize some of the results that we found for these different scenarios and what we found uh, related to the magnetic field strength plus the spin period of the neutron star. So let's go and well, let's go and talk about fast rotating neutron stars. So I know that talking about fast rotating neutron stars and saying 10 seconds may maybe is uh, very slow for other people because they work in millisecond pulsars. But for this field, uh, 10 seconds, let's say, is fast. So we followed this system in 2000, uh, the outputs of the system for U0115 in 2015 using SWIFT and XMM. Uh, so as you can see in this light curve, uh, let's focus a little bit in the X-rays because the black uh, points are uh, uh, SWIFT bad, so hard, harder X-rays. Let's go to the, the X, uh, XRT SWIFT um, data. So we saw we follow the decay of this outburst. And the first thing that we find is that this system enter in around 10 to the 35 X per seconds enter, enter the propeller regime. Okay, nice. We saw propeller regime. Check. Um, so in propeller regime, uh, then we didn't expect to find a kind of uh, emission after propeller regime since accretion like uh, matter is in theory not reaching the surface of the neutron star. But what happened is that we see emission above the quiescence uh, level of the, the system. So, okay, where this uh, uh, emission comes from? So we started th uh, thinking that maybe this system could show a uh, cooling emission from the neutron star. Because uh, as you can see, levels here were 10 to the 37 Earths per second. It, quickly decreased to 10 to the 33. And our last data, uh, that which was a deep XMM Newton observation, uh, we detected the source at 10 to the 32 X per, per, per second. So if we study luminosity and temperature, we see a nicely decay in luminosity and a nicely decay in temperature. So another check, okay, we, we uh, see a cooling emission. However, a late time deep swift observation uh, reveal uh, suddenly uh, a rise in temperature and luminosity. So now the question is why this thing happen if it was cooling? It's impossible that if it is cooling, the temperature suddenly goes up. So if we, okay, focus in these different points, one, two, and three, and we go back to our light cure and uh, plot the periastron passage of the neutron star, we see that one and three are close to periastron. However, the deep observation that we got with XMM is in the in apastron, so in the farthest point. And if we study the spectral uh, shape of these different observations, we see that uh, they show different behavior. So for those that are close to periastron, they are the spectra is quite hard and is uh, related to accretion. And however, the second observation, it has a nicely shaped uh, thermal emission uh, with a black body. So what we think is that uh, even we are in a propeller regime, uh, there is some way of, uh, a, some way in the system that this low level accretion can happen close to periastron even if the, the accretion is inhibited, centrifugally inhibited. Okay, so, okay, let's go to slow rotators. So slow rotators, what we expect from them are spin periods of more than uh, 100 seconds. And we, fo uh, we follow then uh, this uh, system with SWIFT. And as we see, it has, it show nice type one outwards during periastron in the vertical lines, as you can see here. And suddenly we see a constant decay emission above the propeller regime. And suddenly it starts again with the periastron and then goes down. So this is what we expect from uh, what we call uh, accretion from the cold disk. To double check this uh, scenario, we follow another source, GX304. And then we saw that during the uh, uh, type one outwards between them, we could detect cold disk emission. 
However, the system since 2016 doesn't, it didn't show any type one uh, outburst. So the question is like, okay, if it doesn't show outburst, then the aggression disk is not filled. However, we still find this continuous decay emission and a const more or less a const constant level. So what we decided is at this uh, uh, state to ob obtain a nuestral observation and to study the, the phase, the spectral shape. And as you can see here, during outbursts, um, the shape of the, the spectral shape is very different from what we, we have during this called the disk phase. Uh, still, we have two components and an emission uh, at the hard, uh, hard energies. So what we are seeing is like emission from the uh, neutron star surf, uh, neutron star atmosphere plus a hard component that is due to the disk cold accretion in the magnetic poles of the neutron star. And just to double check, we also found pulsations at this level. Now, during the cold disk accretion, we expect a decay, but still we find this little variability in X-rays that we don't have an answer for. So we are still uh, in, like looking for some answers for this low uh, variability in X-rays, especially because it's not related to the periaston passage. And then we have the intermediate rotators, which, is, which are the ones that are between 10 seconds and 100 seconds. And if we go to their uh, light curves, uh, we see that they show uh, some kind of reflaring activity, especially after type two outbursts. However, we still don't have any answer for these systems, why this reflaring activity happens. And uh, it could be either that the decretion disk around the companion star is uh, so extended that the neutron star is still accreting from this material. It could be due to these instabilities in the accretion disk of the neutron star or even a combined structure uh, of the binary plane and the, the, the creation this plane. Just to let it, you know, for some systems, this reflecting activity is not related to periastron passage. So as you can see here, the, the neutron star is accreting at, a, at the farthest point of the binary. So just as a takeaway message uh, for you from the binary VX binary wall, uh, they show a big variety of X-ray behavior when they are not in outbursts at low X-ray luminosities. The next step would have to uh, get some multi-wavelength studies because of course we are forgetting about one important component of these systems and it's the companion star. So of course changes in, in the, this companion star may lead from some answers uh, to this vari uh, variability that we see. But what we can say is that fast rotating neutron stars show propeller regime plus cooling emission. The slow rotating neutron stars show accretion disk from this called uh, ionized disk, non-ionized disk, sorry. And medium rotating neutron stars uh, show reflecting activity after type two outbursts. Um, now I will stop here this part of the talk. Um, I would like to, if you anyone has any question, I would like to answer them, them because we will now continue with our tale to the double neutron star uh, binary mergers. Uh, so we have a question in the Slack channel. Uh, Mohit, do you wanna go ahead and ask the question? Yeah, sure. So my question is, did anyone study a uh, BE X-ray binary systems? Uh, here, compact object should be neutron star and during the outburst phase, simultaneously in radio and X-ray wavelength. Yeah, uh, there is a work done uh, by uh, the group in Amsterdam, uh, Jacob, Batten, Jacob Van den Eyden and Nathalie Tegenar. So for a long time ago, a long time, it was thought that high mass uh, X-ray binaries and in, in theory B X ray transients, they didn't emit, uh, they weren't detected in radio. So there was this system that it, the, it is a UL, uh, ultraluminous X-ray source in the galaxy. Um, it went under, undergo, underwent, underwent through a type two outburst, and it was detected in uh, radio and X-rays. So it, it 
I'm sorry. So is there any correlation between uh, the luminosity in radio and X-ray? Uh, or is there any dependence in the speed, the spin period of neutron star? Yeah. Uh, well, right now, this is the first I'm going to answer the first question the, about the radio and luminosity. There is this uh, relation between radio and luminosity of uh, binaries. Um, so you see that the binaries with black holes follow a different trend than the ones that had neutron stars. And then um, for this case, in this uh, VX ray transient, the emission uh, in the radio wasn't correlated to the X-rays. So it was kind of a plain like constant. Um, I'm sorry, the next question was about, sorry. No, I'm also wondering whether the spin period of- The spin period, yeah, thank you. Uh, still, we don't know um, because uh, we only detected this uh, OLE system. So right now we are trying to also to observe different PS uh, ray transients in radio and X-rays. So it's still a work on, we are working on that. Thank you very much for your answer. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I have a quick question that's yeah, about I... the sort of physics of the disk, the cold disk phase. This is just to make sure I understood how that works. So you have material that cools down enough that it becomes neutral and that it's no longer entrained in the magnetic field. And so it falls toward the neutron star just under the force of gravity. And then when it gets close, it reheats because of irradiation from the star. Is that how it works? Or did I miss yeah. some part of no, no. why yeah. it falls in? Yeah, it falls uh, in because of the, yeah, it gets uh, closer due to the gravity. And also uh, for this kind of systems, uh, because they are slow rotators, the um, proper layer uh, regime, so the proper layer uh, limit, let's say, magnetic, the magnetic barrier is close to them, closer to the magnetic field, uh, to the surface of the neutron star. So it let, let the accretion disk to come closer to the neutron star. So fa for fast rotating, the magnetic uh, barrier is farther from the neutron star surface. So that's why you know you, you have this propeller effect. While for slow rotators, the material really can get close to the uh, neutron star. Great, thank you very much. Hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay. Okay. So, okay. So let's go and continue with our fairy tale. Of, so let's um, go to the last stage of our binary when we have a compact object, object binary. And um, specifically, I will focus on the X rays of this uh, state. And in, I will let you know, but in particular, for, for I will start, uh, introduce you some studies in the, the world of the GRB in next phase. So first of all, what's, what is a GRB? So GRB are, as you can see, rap rapid, highly energetic explosions uh, that release gamma ray radiation and they occur at cosmological distances. So from the information that we get uh, from Fermi and uh, Swift, uh, Swift uh, we can divide this population of GRBs in two sub subpopulations. We have short GRBs and long GRBs. And this is uh, based on the duration of the uh, signal. So for short GRBs, normally they last less than two seconds, are less energetic, like they, we have energies around 10 to the 51 ergs, and they, show, they normally appear in environments that where the density is low. And this is due because this is due to the fact that we see GRB, so GRBs uh, at high higher offsets from the host galaxy, and it is thought that the progenitors of these short GRBs are double double neutron star mergers. On the other hand, we have long GRBs, which duration is longer than two seconds, and they are quite energy energetic, ten to the fifty three x, and they appear in higher uh, density environments. And this is uh, what thought because uh, we find long GRBs 
within the host galaxy and they are thought to be also the progenitors of um, sorry the progenitors of these events are the, the death of massive stars so in particular i would like to focus on this uh, grb uh, 18 uh, sorry uh, i will continue so in the case of short grbs uh, if we have a binary with two neutron stars and they merge we see a signal as a short grb which uh, we detect in gamma rays so in this moment, right after the explosion, the central engine uh, launches a collimated relativistic outflow, uh, what we call jet. And the bulk Lorentz factor of this jet evolves in time uh, since the jet interacts with the medium. Uh, so once the Lorentz uh, factor of this jet equals the inverse value of the opening angle of the jet, we see a uh, like a significant temporal uh, stepping in the afterglow like afterglow light cure of the GRB. So as you can see here, uh, if we follow in X-rays the GRB, uh, the, suddenly at a certain time there is a change in the step. So this time is what we call the time of a jet break, and from this jet break we can infer uh, the values of the opening angles for GRBs. And once we have these values of opening angles, we can uh, study the distribution of these events and infer rates for uh, GRBs and compare them with the rates that we obtain uh, for neutron star neutron star mergers uh, from LIGO. So now, yes, uh, I will talk about uh, this uh, one of the latest GRBs that we were studying, 1804-18A that was followed uh, by different uh, facilities, uh, even in the space and here in the Earth. So let's go and see what happened with this Fermi and Swift data that we obtained for this uh, GRB and let's see why this GRB is uh, so important. So <clears throat> we reanalyzed the data of this, show, this uh, GRB because uh, from SWIFT, but we have a duration that is in the limit. I don't know if you remember, but from short GRBs, the limit is short are less than two seconds, and if anything above two seconds is long GRB. But for SWIFT, from SWIFT, we got 1.9 seconds, and from Fermi, we got 2.5 seconds. So what happens with this case is that the 17 of, uh, uh, sorry, 18 of 18A is an ambigu ambiguous case, since if it is short, there is a longer duration and there is a softer uh, than normal, normal short GRBs. And if it is long, then the duration is very short. So we uh, study the whole population of Fermi GRBs and we plot the hardness versus uh, duration. So in red, you can see the short GRBs and in blue, the long GRBs. And in between, we find or uh, GRB 18 or 418. And just as a reference, you can see here 170817, which is the GRB, uh, the emission or the, let's say, the, the, the uh, gravitational wave event uh, that show, uh, show us in the past that the short GRBs are um, most like, like progenitors are uh, double neutron star mergers. So they are quite similar in the they are placed in similar uh, space uh, hardness and duration. Uh, however, 1708-17 17 was softer than our event. So if we draw a probability for this uh, event, we see that the uh, probability from, for being short is a 60%. Still, it's not a 100%. So we need more information just to be sure that we can say that 1708-18A uh, is a short GRB. So we studied the, the, the X-ray afterglow of this event uh, just to check that it was if it was similar or not to sh other short GRBs. Uh, so if we just take into account SWIFT uh, data, we see a decay, initial decay in the light curve. However, we see a kind of initial uh, decay plus plateau. And this plateau is very difficult to explain for a short GRB that is decaying since what you just expect is just a decay in time. 
So we inspected our Chandra observations. And what, what we found, as you can see here, is that, OK, we have our afterglow in X-rays. However, there was a contaminating, uh, like a companion or nebihurin source in X-rays that if we uh, plot or a source region in XRT, we see that we also are getting some contribu contribution in X-rays uh, from this nebihurin source. So as you can see here, we have the X-ray afterglow detected in, by SWIFT in XRT uh, plus the contaminating source. So what we did is to model the X-rays of this uh, GRB and just to eliminate the contaminating so source uh, flux level in X-rays and to plot our Chandra uh, observations. And what we found is that, first of all, the afterglow in X-rays is well modeled by, by a single power low decay. And second of all, uh, we don't detect the jet break of this uh, uh, GRB up to 39 days. And this is very weird because um, there are only a um, bunch, like three or four GRBs in X-rays that have been detected at later times, like uh, 10 time referring like 20 days after 20 days. The rest of them have been only monitored at the beginning of the, since the trigger of the GRB, uh, some hours uh, till one day or two. So if we compare 18 or 418A with the family uh, of uh, GRBs of Swift, Swift GRBs, uh, we plot uh, the luminosity versus the rest frame time for all the GRBs. So, and we compare uh, this GRB to th uh, 350 long GRBs and 37 short GRBs. And for the short GRBs, we had into account uh, the late XM and uh, Newton and channel observations. And we found that only two of the short GRBs can track the behavior of this, uh, of this source, uh, especially at the late times, even though 05, 12, 20, 21A decays uh, fastly than quicker than our GRB. So let's check and select two different uh, times. Let's say one time that is um, at earlier times and then one that is uh, at late times. And let's suppose that our uh, GRB is uh, placed at a redshift one and 1.5 and I will let you know later on why this, this redshift. But what we find is that for earlier times, our GRB is close to the population or the distribution for, for short GRBs. And if it is a place at 1.5 uh, and at a residue of 1.5, is even uh, more in accordance with the long family, long uh, GRB family. However, for late times, we see that for both redshifts is uh, in agreement with the long uh, GRB population. Why we think is uh, this is, can be due to a bias since we only have this uh, kind of uh, three GRBs at late times. Uh, so we need more information about short GRBs at late, the X-ray, short GRBs at late times in X-rays. So we want, but of course, uh, we didn't have a final uh, classification because of course from Fermi, we have a 60% uh, probability of being short this uh, comparison with the Swift, uh, Swift GRBs is not uh, very clear because it's in the limit between the short and uh, long GRBs. So what we decided is to plot uh, the values of uh, the gamma rays uh, and with what we call the amateur relation. And it's a relation between the, en the peak energy of the spectrum in gamma rays versus the whole like energy that we get from this uh, uh, GRB. And as you can see, red points are short GRBs and long, uh, blue points are long GRBs. And all each family follow its relation. And as we can see, independently of the redshift of our GRB is in agreement with the short GRB amateur relation. So this brings us to the possibility that 1704-17A is potentially a short GRB. 
let's go and continue our study in ex, uh, in optical now and what is good from this uh, GRB is that we had a follow-up in, uh, in optical till almost five days and we could detect a host galaxy for this uh, um, for this um, GRB. So the rest of, the, of this uh, galaxy is between 1 and 2.05 uh, although I say 1 and 1.5 because uh, we just take this uh, nominal or um, values between in this uh, um, in this uh, range of redshifts. So one, that's why we know that it has to be between those redshifts. So if we plot and get all the all the data in the optical uh, in the early time, uh, it was uh, suggested that uh, it was the first GRB with uh, what we call reverse shock detected in optical for short GRBs, and with all our data and modeling, we could confirm that this uh, GRB is a uh, show a reverse shock in at early times. And at a certain point, it changed to the forward shock, which is the afterglow that uh, everyone uh, is follow uh, knows. Like, uh, and we don't detect a jet break as it happens in for X-rays, and it's also well modeled by a single power law. So if we get all this information together, we can get some inner side of the energy and density of this uh, GRB and get some uh, values for the upper limit for the uh, lower limit, sorry, for the opening angle of this, this jet. And we can see that uh, is between the limit for short GRBs. Uh, so for our GRB, we would say that in the angle is at least eight degrees of uh, eight degrees. So what we can get with from this is to place this lower limit with the distribution for short GRBs and get a little bit of more of insights of uh, what is happening here. Um, so as a conclusion, uh, based on the traditional classification, based on the uh, duration and hardness uh, and the amatic relation, we find that GRB 18 or 418 is most likely a short GRB. Uh, it's one of the first GRBs that are, are, is detected at late, at late times uh, in X-rays. Uh, it's also the first GRB, uh, if it is short, in uh, being detected with a reverse shock at early times. We also know that the, it has a host galaxy because we detected in the optical. And we can place some limits in the, for the opening angle, at least at the lower, lower side of the, the range. So as a takeaway message for GRBs, uh, multi-wavelength observations of, GRB or of GRBs are essential to disentangle not uh, only the energetics, but also the jet structures and uh, opening angles. Uh, it's necessary to have more uh, monitoring at late times in X-rays, uh, especially for uh, short GRBs, because we need to populate this part of the, the, the plot uh, that it will I think bring us more knowledge about the distribution of uh, short GRBs and their uh, opening angles. And if we detect jet breaks, we can get a rate for short GRBs and then we can compare this rate for short GRBs with the rate that we get from neutron star, neutron star mergers from LIGO. So this is uh, the end of my second part of the talk. Uh, so I'm open to any question. Uh, thanks, Alicia. Uh, do we have any questions? I don't want to take all the question time, but I have a question. <laughs> so um, I'm wondering when you think about this work of monitoring short GRBs at late times, whether or not you've identified sort of the suite of instruments that is best for doing that work, um, or whether or not you think we just sort of throw at it whatever we can. <laughs> and also I'm wondering what sort of over what time scales you think the most important observations will come. Is it something like 
within the first week? Is it still useful out beyond that? Um, so those two questions about just sort of the observing approach for doing this. Can, sorry, can, can you repeat the first question? Oh, the first one was just what instruments, what instruments, ah, group of instruments do you think are the best? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for like, let's say, um, uh, for like, the instruments that we, we are using and I think right now is the only ones that we have there is uh, like ones that we have the uh, Fermi trigger and the confirmation by Swift. At uh, time, uh, every time we will follow up with Swift because uh, it, due to the easy way that we have we, for monitoring the, the events with this uh, telescope or facility. And then at late times, um, I would say Chandra, I don't want to blame XMM, <laughs> but I think Ch like Chandra is uh, one of the main uh, observatories that is the best for this kind of monitoring, especially if uh, you have several X-ray sources around. Due to the PSF of XMM, I, I have found so several uh, cases where I couldn't model any afterglow in X-rays. However, with uh, Chandra, <clears throat> I, I was able, and in this case, for example, it's a clear case where Chandra is necessary because either way, uh, you just have a contaminating source and you didn't even know. And for the monitoring, so we have um, right now, um, so what we do is um, uh, we need a special, uh, let's say, a decay index, uh, around minus one. That means that it's not too fast in the game. And that can give us um, a hint that maybe we can detect even farther than several days. Uh, so what we do is if the earlier data follow a decay index of minus around minus one, we trigger our first observation. And then we see uh, what it Pulse. And then if it is continue with uh, this uh, decay index, then we will trigger a next observation in within one week and then see if uh, it's there or not. If it is not there, it's because a jet break happened. So we can constrain the jet break within that time. So it's still really requiring pretty fast triggers for Chandra. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, so, it's difficult. I know. <laughs> all of us are like, you know, crossing our fingers yeah. and saying that mm -hmm. Chandra will stick around to let us do these things. But okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it was a little longer than that was still possible, mm -hmm. but it's still within sort of like a week mm -hmm. and a half of the burst. Is that? Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. Around that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah. But it's still, I mean, I don't want to blame XMM. XMM is a still a nice observatory and some science, like you can do this science, but the problem is that sometimes you have this extra sources and you cannot, you know, uh, disentangle it. Thanks. Thank you, Daryl. If you have any other questions, you can just like unmute yourself and jump in or you can raise your hand. So I have one other question, just since I've, you know, because <laughs> I think this stuff is neat. I have, this is a totally, this is a totally off the wall question. Um, and I, I have no idea if this is even a meaningful comparison, but there's this super massive black hole binary OJ287, which has like a super massive black hole configuration, which is so much like those um, BE X-ray binaries, where there's like a disk and there's two supermassive black holes, one that's orbiting around the other and punches through the disk and has these periodic flares. Have you ever heard people trying to draw analogies between these sort of interesting low mass systems and then maybe an analog at higher mass? I'm not sure even what one would glean from that. It's just that when I look at like all the press release images, they look so similar. And some mm -hmm. of the, I don't know, I wonder whether or not some of those accretion mechanisms might be um, better understood in the low mass systems and hence maybe interestingly applicable to the higher mass ones. But yeah, I haven't heard about that. 
but yeah I, I think there are kind of uh, like you can extrapolate this physics uh, to from the low mass let's say environment to the super uh, massive black holes um, so definitely I think you we like it would be nice to you know investigate a little bit more because of course it's there is uh, in the nature of these uh, systems and you know um, accretion is a like universal uh, process so it could be interesting to have like to extrapolate this behavior to super uh, supermassive uh, black hole binaries <laughs> yeah uh, especially if the, you have this, uh, uh, this, let's say, periodical emission, that must be something related to some uh, periodicity in the sea, you know, in there. I don't know what can be, but basically, yeah, uh, some kind of uh, periodical aggression. So it must be, a, I would say, some resource of mat material there that every time that something, you know, crosses, you have this emission in X-rays. Yeah, I don't know. Cool. thanks. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, maybe those connections are there. I think a lot of the mechanisms, the physical mechanisms you talked about seem to be really controlled by the neutron star and the magnetic field of the neutron star. And that probably is not a correct analogy with a black hole system, but maybe some of the interesting sort of periodicities at but, yeah. Mary Astron and- hmm. Yeah, I think especially like if it is something periodical, uh, I mean, it must be something due to the some, I think, uh, some periodicity in the orbit or something yeah. that is orbiting around at some point. Yeah. yeah, 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 that's my impression as well. Cool, mm. thank you. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Okay, otherwise, like, let's all uh, thank Alicia again thank uh, you. for a great talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. <laughs> thank you very much. That was really clear. Thank you.